Thanks to digital technology, we live in a time where we have access to what's happening around the world 24-7 on our mobile devices. But what's it like if you're a young person, a girl, to grow up in a world that's not always real? Lisa Damore is a clinical psychologist and executive director of the Research on Girls Center at the Laura School in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Her new book is Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. And she joins us now on how to help them cope and even thrive through the tough times. It's very nice to meet you, Dr. Damore. Thank you for having me. I really like this book. I really enjoyed it. I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, one's a girl and one's a boy. But I think some of the things that you write about can address both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the unique pressures girls experience that create this epidemic of stress that you write about? So we are seeing a rise of stress and anxiety in kids across the board. But there are some extra weights that girls carry. Mm -hmm. So girls are excellent students. They take school very seriously. And we have a lot of data showing that they feel more stressed by school, mm -hmm. even when doing better than boys. They still feel stressed by school. Um, we also see that girls more than boys worry about their appearance. And this is something our culture signals to them is Social a very, yep, very yeah. powerful force. And so girls are spending more time than boys preoccupied with their appearance, measuring themselves against what they see online, um, and that that creates a whole other layer of stress for them. We also see that girls share with us that they feel more stressed about how things are going socially that they um, talk about when they're, when they're in social, you know, kind of discord with their friends. Mm -hmm. they, they express feeling more bothered by that. It stays with them longer. They share more. They Sometimes what we call ruminate, they go around and around and around and talk about so it a lot. So it stays in their mind. Kind of stays in their mind, yeah. sort of, you know, grinding on, on it in a way that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. um, boys, by contrast, are better at distracting themselves or letting things go when they're not going well socially. Um, sometimes this means that boys don't get the social support they need, but it also means that they don't necessarily, um, you know, just really kind of weigh some, the same thing over and over again without feeling better about it. When we think about anxiety, we often think about it as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you actually write that we should regard anxiety as an ally, not an enemy. Um, what do you mean by that? So one of the real forces that had me write this book was that the way we understand Psychology, you know, psychologists understand stress and anxiety is very different from how the culture has been talking about it. So the culture generally talks about stress and anxiety as though they are always harmful, always bad. But that's actually not how we see it. So for anxiety in particular, what we've long understood as psychologists is that anxiety is a normal signaling system. It's a system that alerts us when there's a threat and it's built into humans to keep us safe. So one way to kind of Picture it is to think about, say, a caveman, you know, out on the plains who sees a saber-toothed tiger. That caveman who gets the anxiety response, whose, you know, heart starts to gallop in their chest and their breathing changes and they feel all uncomfortable up their back, and who has that response and feels terribly uncomfortable and thinks, I have to do something, I have to, I have to do something about this, and who runs then for the cave, mm -hmm. that caveman likely survived to pass genes down to us. But if we picture a caveman who sees a saber-toothed tiger and is like, that's a pretty cool tiger, right? <laughs> oh, hi, tiger. Hi, tiger, <laughs> yeah. right? They probably did not survive to pass genes down to us. So for psychologists, anxiety is seen as a normal and healthy function. And it can get out of control, and it can be too much. But most of the time, it's there to keep us protected. Right. Um, when I talk with teenagers, as, as I spend a lot of my time doing, I will say to them, look, if you show up at a party and you feel really anxious, pay attention to that feeling, right? Don't. So it's not necessarily a bad thing no. when you feel it. When you feel it, like yeah. usually it's cueing you that there is some threat in the environment. And I'll say to them, you know, don't start drinking to make your anxiety go away. And, and I do think that a lot of the very heavy drinking we sometimes see in high school and college is that kids are in situations that they know are not really altogether safe. And they're having a helpful anxiety response. And then because we've sort of given anxiety this bad name, they feel like this is bad, I gotta do something about it. And drinking does make your anxiety go down. Yeah. Um, but then it can lead to other But then we have also a whole so set of other problems right. that come with that. So what's the yeah. difference then uh, between stress and anxiety? So in many ways, they're fraternal twins. You know, they have a lot in common. 
when we look in very technical terms at, at how, how we think about it, stress is when there's a very heavy demand on you, when what is being asked of you by circumstances is at the edge of your capacities, when you feel stretched, um, when a lot, you know, you're sort of working at your edge. For anxiety, we talk about it in terms of fear or dread, right? Mm -hmm. But in practical terms, they get all wound up with each other, right? So I may have a huge amount of work to do, which is very stressful, and then I'm gonna become anxious about whether or not I can get it done, you know? So often in my writing and in my speaking, I, I almost use them interchangeably because that's often how people experience them. Um, in Under Pressure, you point out that Studies find that girls are more empathetic than boys, a difference that is explained by how we socialize our daughters and sons, not by some innate biological factor. Girls, more than boys, are raised on a steady diet of encouragement to think about how the other person would feel, mm -hmm. which means that if your daughter's friend finds herself on the sharp end of a social stick, your daughter will feel some pain too. Mm -hmm. um, would you suggest that parents scale back on the think how the other person would feel messaging for their daughters? No, I actually, I'm all for empathy. I think we should scale up on that messaging for our sons, right? Because we do see this difference um, by middle childhood that boys um, in measurements that we can count on seem less empathic, but it's not because boys are less empathic. It's because we have not coached them in the same ways. I do think though, we have to be careful of what we call, in that, in that passage I'm describing, vicarious stress. And this is something girls are uniquely good at. So if you're my friend and you're upset and you tell me about it, now I'm upset because you're <laughs> upset, right? So that adds to the stress girls feel. And boys are better than girls at not doing that, right? They may say like, buddy, I'm sorry that you're in pain, but. But would yeah. you also say that sometimes girls will think, if I do something and it hurts somebody else's feelings, I don't want to do that. I want to please that person. Well, it, it can encourage girls to be more cautious in their behavior, especially when they're about to do something that might not be kind. What we want to do as parents is intervene a little bit if we have a daughter who's worrying terribly about a friend's pain. You know, that's a place where we can step in and say, you know, you ruminating about how upset your friend is doing is, isn't gonna make it better for her. What could you do to make it better? You know, to sort of move them from action to, you know, to action from just going over it again and again. In the book too, you have um, a study where you write about a young girl who wanted to quit um, I think she was a gymnast. She mm -hmm. wanted to quit what sport she was yes, doing. Yes. But her coach was like, I really don't want you to mm -hmm. leave. I really want you on the team. Mm -hmm. But she, the girl was really stressed and mm -hmm. then she stayed on the team. Mm -hmm. So how do you teach girls to say, there's a limit yeah. and I can only do so much when they're, not, when they're trying not to please other people? Yeah, so girls really are trained by our culture to be agreeable. You know, we really expect that if we ask a girl to do something, she's gonna say yes. Mm -hmm. And in that um, story, which I shared, the girl I was caring for really wanted to quit gymnastics. And when she took it to her coach, her coach was like, oh, I'll be so disappointed. And so the girl went back on her own plan because she didn't want to let down this grown up. So there are a couple of things we need to do to help girls out. One is we can't abuse the fact that they want to please us, right? And this is something for teachers to be careful of and parents to be careful of, that we say we want girls to be autonomous and empowered, usually up until the point that they're not doing what we want them to do. So we have to own that. The other thing that I talk about a lot in this book is helping girls have ways to turn people down that still preserves the relationship. Because girls care about relationships and boys care about relationships. But if we just say to girls, just say no, just say you're not gonna do it, that doesn't leave them with enough to go on because they know full well, if I just say to my coach, nope, I'm not doing it, I'm actually really damaging our connection. So I talk in this book about several strategies we can give girls where they can honor their own wishes and yet keep on good terms. And so in that particular story, I talked about what I, I call the yes, no, yes formula. And I actually picked this up from a book by William Urey mm -hmm. called The Power of a Positive No. And it's a business book, but it has actually been game changing for me. And, and in that book, he talks about a formula where first you figure out what you're saying yes to. So for this particular client, she was wanting to say yes to getting more sleep, getting more rest, mm -hmm. taking a break from gymnastics. So she had to say no to her coach. And then the final yes is what you can say yes to. So the way we finally resolved it for her is she said to her coach, you know, I am really tired. I need more sleep. I'm going to stop gymnastics, but can I keep coming to meets and cheering for the younger girls? And that formula allowed the girl to both stop gymnastics 
and preserve the working relationship. And in a way that made her comfortable. Yep. Um, you also uh, talk about um, glitter jars. <laughs> uh, we're going to show a clip of it and how glitter mm -hmm. jars can be used to reduce anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. How did you first run across this idea and how do they work? Okay, so glitter jars are relevant to the issue of, oh, these are great. <laughs> they're, they're relevant to the issue of helping kids through meltdowns. And it is true that at various points in development, and certainly during maybe like 13, 14 for girls, mm -hmm. meltdowns can be pretty powerful and pretty intense. And I take care of teenage girls in my private practice, and I also consult to a girls' school, so I have seen a lot of meltdowns. And I think, like many adults, I often felt sort of stupefied by this <laughs> meltdown. You, know, you have a girl who just loses it. And so then you try to jump in and help. You say, like, what's going on? What happened? And then she just gets worse. And then you say, I'm sure it's not that bad. And then she just gets worse. And so after sort of muddling through this for a while, I um, really quite by accident came across this terrific solution. And I was in um, Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. sitting around with a bunch of counselors at this fantastic girls' school called Ursuline Dallas. And we were talking about girls having meltdowns. And one of the counselors says, oh, well, that's when I get out a glitter jar. You were kind of skeptical. You were like, this is pop psychology, <laughs> right? Skeptical. Well, she said, she said, well, I'll go get you one. And when she left, I thought, OK. And she was going to come back. I thought, whatever she's bringing back, like, I hate it. Like, I, already I already hate, hate it. it. I already hate it. And first I thought, like, I hate glitter. Like, you know, I'm a mom. I hate glitter. I hate it when kids have it. Because it lives with you after you, You're just you stuck know, with it, it forever, right? Yeah. You can never get rid of it. Um, and then I hate pop psychology. And yeah. I thought, this sounds like it is you know, the all-time pop solution. So she comes back, and she has a jar. It's about this big. It's clear. It's filled with water. The lid is glued on. And she sits down. It's got, oh, it's got two tablespoons of like sparkly purple glitter in uh -huh. the bottom. And she sits down, and she says, um, so when a girl comes to my office like that, she goes, I do this. You know? And she shakes it like a snow globe. And it, it does. It turns into this purple storm in there. And then she sets it down, and she says, and then I say to the girl, honey, this is your brain right now. Mm. And I'm thinking, OK. And then she says, and then I say, so first, we're going to settle your glitter. And I thought, OK, this is genius. This is absolutely genius, right? So what she had is a perfect model of the neurology of the adolescent brain. Um, teenagers' brains are renovating through the course of adolescence, becoming more efficient and more powerful. But they renovate in the order in which they initially developed, which is bad news for the teenager. Because the first renovation happens in the more primitive regions back here. Mm. Later, the more sophisticated regions up here get renovated. And the emotions are back here. And the ability to maintain perspective is up here. So there is a juncture in adolescence where teenagers, when they are upset, the more primitive regions can override the whole system and take it down. And, and that's what a glitter storm is. I think it's so helpful for parents to understand mm -hmm. that instead of saying, oh, my kid doesn't listen to me. Yes. What's wrong with my kid? Yes. But it's also helpful for the child because they realize it's not really my fault. The brain is dysregulated. It's that's just, all that's happened. And one thing yeah. I found really interesting about your book was that, you know, as parents, as grown-ups, we always want to fix things. Yes. Um, but you say that it's important to validate whatever feeling yeah. the child is experiencing and then to offer them some problem-solving skills. If they still need it, exactly. And, and what I've really come to appreciate is we have tremendous power as parents to determine what comes of our kids' anxiety. How we react really drives what happens next. So if a young person comes to us and is hugely upset and we become upset and seem very anxious, and we react to them almost as though they're on fire and they need to be put out, mm. we actually, I think, make them more frightened of their emotions. If we react, and this is what the glitter jar is so good at reminding the grown-up to do, if we react as though they are fundamentally self-correcting and the brain will reset, and if we are calm and we just honor that they got overwhelmed emotionally mm. and we wait and that the brain will reset all by itself, we're actually sending a message of, you are self-correcting, you can handle this, I can handle you being upset, and it makes a huge difference for and, what happens next. And some of the helpful words you use, stinks, and what was the other one? <laughs> handle. Handle. So, <laughs> so one of the things I have found, so when teenagers especially tell me about difficulties, yeah. you know, um, like, I have this horrible test I've got to take tomorrow, or this, like, terrible task got dropped on me, I have found that just those two words, so first I say, oh, that stinks, that stinks, and that, that one little word is me saying, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm totally going to empathize. I'm going to take this at face value. I'm not going to question it. I'm not going to minimize it. And usually, it's very powerful for them. And then, once that has sunk in, I will say, 
how are you going to handle it? And, and that combination of both utterly endorsing the emotion and also endorsing the sense that they can manage this, they've got the resources, um, I find moves things in the right direction. I mean, for teenagers, something else that they, um, I, I, we do too, mm -hmm. is our phones. We have our phones on all the time. Um, but you say that they are the world handiest trash yes. shoots. Uh, what do you mean by that? So one of the things that has always been true of teenagers is that if they're having an uncomfortable feeling, they often want to dump it on a parent, right? And I, I remember being in college, right, long before cell phones, mm -hmm. and having a, like some Saturday night when I was upset about something and calling my mom. I was in college in Connecticut, calling my mother in Colorado and, oh, you know, about whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then I think as soon as I had dumped it, I felt much, much better mm -hmm. and probably went out and had a good time. And I remember she called me the next morning. She's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Like, what, like, what? You sound tired. And I realized she had been up all night, you know, worrying about me. Mm -hmm. So we now have this process on steroids. We now have the technology that allows kids to give their parents real-time updates on their mood. And it is really quite common at this point for teenagers who are in the middle of their school day, who get a bad test back or have a fight with a friend, to text a parent and tell them that this has occurred. And usually they have the same experience I did in college, which is as soon as they've dumped it, they feel much better. But now you don't. But now the parent is a disaster <laughs> and the parent is really upset. And so we have to really mind this process, both because we want teenagers to develop coping resources that go beyond dumping emotions on their parents. And we also don't want parents who get to the end of the day completely frazzled because they've spent all day worrying about a kid who is actually able to manage independently if they wanted to. And journaling, you say, is something that's good. They can write down their feelings, and then at yeah. the end of the day, they can show it to you. If they want. And you, if they want. Yeah. Um, in Under Pressure, you point out that there are three unhealthy forms of conflict management. What are they? So kids come into conflict with each other. This is a very common source of stress. And we're not always good as adults at teaching them how to do conflict well. And, and often it's because we're not that good at doing conflict well. So I now really like to teach kids conflict and teach them how to do conflict. Mm -hmm. So I say to them, okay, there are three unhealthy forms of conflict. There's being a bulldozer, that's sort of the metaphor for running people over. There's being a doormat where you allow yourself to be run over. And there's being a doormat with spikes, which is the most common form, which is basically passive aggressive behavior. And there I even say to kids, okay, we can even break that down. Mm -hmm. There's using guilt as a weapon. There's you know playing the part of a victim and there's involving third parties in what should be really a two-party disagreement. So those are the unhealthy forms. And then I say um, there's a healthy form, and it's to be a pillar, which is where you stand up for yourself while being respectful of everybody else. And then I like to give them scenarios that we play with, and they're very good, usually, at playing out all of the different unhealthy forms. They can readily imagine mm -hmm. how they would, you know, if they saw, say, a, a friend put something up online of a party that they invited everybody to, but, you know, except for the kid who happened to see it, mm -hmm. Um, if they're injured by that. Like we can imagine all the bulldozer doormatty and certainly doormatty with spikes things they might do. And once they've done that, I'll say, okay, and if you were gonna pillar this, you know, what might you do? And, and they can say, oh, I would, I would ask the friend that say, hey, you at a party, are we okay? But it's really helpful to teach them. Like everybody's got these impulses. A lot of people are using these unhealthy forms. Mm -hmm. You can imagine them, you can play them out in your mind. But if you're really gonna act, you wanna act as a pillar. I mean, these are tips that you're using for young women, but I know oh, yeah. people my age, <laughs> and me sometimes, guilty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've behaved in not so great um, yeah. ways. Yeah. So why do we find the unhealthy approaches to conflict management so much easier than taking the pillar approach? Um, I do think some of it is just we don't talk about conflict and we don't talk about doing it effectively. And so we just sort of bend towards our less healthy options. Mm -hmm. I also think it's the case that to act as a pillar is exhausting, right? To really um, contain one's strong reaction and give the person you're upset with a chance to handle themselves well is hard. Um, I have increasingly, in thinking especially with girls about conflict though, I've increasingly also asked them the question, is this a conflict that's worth your while? Because we often feel, especially with girls, when we're trying to sort of empower them, we're often like, you know, she said that, you've got to respond to her. You know, she hurt your feelings. You've got to let her know that was bothering you. Um, and when I say to kids, is this a conflict that's going to go well? Is this worth your while? If you pillar this, is she going to pillar back? 
often they'll say, no, you know, yeah. it's not that worth it to me, or I know her, and I can pill her all day long, and she's just going to doormat with spikes, you know. So I've increasingly given girls the chance of saying, like, I'm not sure this is a conflict I want to have. Mm -hmm. And what I say to them then is, you have the option. I'm going to give you one more healthy option here. And it's what I call emotional Aikido, right? So in the martial art of Aikido, if something is coming at you, the first move always is actually to step to the side and let them go by. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, you know, you might want to emotional Aikido this. Okay, so she didn't invite you to the party, but you're not that good of friends. You weren't thinking about inviting her to your next party. What if you just tactically not respond to this? And I have watched so much drama die for kids just saying, you know what, I don't care that much about the relationship. This isn't going to be a valuable conflict. It's not worth it to me. I'm just going to not ignore this. I'm going to make a decision that strategically it's not worth my time. Mm -hmm. um, really gives kids a lot of power. And the only thing you have to be sure to do is to say to them, don't worry, this is not the same as doormatting. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they feel like if I don't say something, I'm letting her roll all over me. And I'm saying, no, doormat is if you're crying in your room wondering why you weren't invited to the party. Emotional Aikido is to say, you know what, I'm going to let this one go. Like choosing your battles. Yeah, I'm going to pick uh, a battle. Something that we've uh, had a lot of uh, conversations about uh, lately is the Me Too movement. Yes. But you recently um, had a discussion with a group of girls at the school where you work. Mm -hmm. um, what was that conversation like? It was eye-opening, really. Um, it was shortly after the Harvey Weinstein story broke, and I was meeting with a bunch of high school girls, and I said to them, do you guys want to talk about this Me Too stuff? And I naively, really naively, went into the conversation thinking that I was going to use that conversation to prepare them for what was ahead. You know, when they were in the professional world, if somebody crossed a line with them, how they were going to handle it. And instead, what happened, and this is in an all-girls environment, this, this conversation happened, they started to pour out stories of how much harassment they are dealing with from boys outside of school. And I was really quite floored. And, and floored both because I really feel like I'm kind of on top of what's happening with kids, like I really am with teenagers all the time, and also just by how pervasive what they were describing was. But what they were describing is actually backed by the research, that we have surveys showing that by eighth grade, half of girls in co-ed environments have dealt with all sorts of harassment, you know, boys touching them, boys starting rumors, boys drawing inappropriate stuff on their notebooks, um, that this is very much standard and normalized in middle school environments, less so a little bit as kids get into high school. But I have really started to think, you know, the Me Too movement, like, we got to deal with the middle school level of the Me Too movement. That has not yet really been at the center. Uh, we only have a few more minutes left, and I want to get a few more questions in. Yeah. Um, but you write that um, culturally, we've placed young women in charge of regulating adolescent yes. sexuality. Yes. Uh, in wh what ways have we done that? So one of the things that concerns me is there's a bit of an offense-defense framework that we advance when we talk with young people, boys and girls, about romance. and. We do it in various ways. So for instance, when we talk about the talk, mm -hmm. it turns out the research tells us there's two talks. So there's the talk for boys and the talk for girls. So the talk for boys usually comes down to us saying, um, all right, buddy, uh, when you have sex, get consent and wear a condom. And when we talk to girls, we usually say, don't get pregnant, don't get an STD, don't get yourself in a bad position. Some adults say this, I don't say this, don't harm your reputation. But it's sort of like, go, go, go for the boys and stop, stop, stop for the girls. And in this and other ways, we, whether we mean to it or not, we basically say, all right, girls, you're going to regulate adolescent sexuality because we're not going to ask the boys. And, and this is something we need to really reconsider as adults because this is not the position we want anybody in. Um, you also write that uh, we routinely teach girls that the only way to turn down sexual activity is with a clear, direct, unmodulated, and unvarnished no. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see as a better alternative to that advice? I think we want to keep that advice on the table. I think we also want to recognize that feminist linguists, such as Deborah Cameron, who I write about in this book, have questioned that advice because it may not match the context a girl is in. So here are two contexts we need to be mindful of. One is where she actually really likes the person she's with, but she doesn't want to go as far as that person wants to go. It's very rare in friendly interactions for people to give a flat refusal. So if I invite you to dinner, I say, would you like to come over for dinner? And you say, no, 
<laughs> right? That would be a very you strange thing. You rarely say things. no, yeah. You don't do that. You yeah. don't do that with people you actually want to maintain a relationship. You start making excuses or whatever, yeah. You, meet, you make excuses. Yeah. This is a widely accepted and understood way in our culture that you refuse things. Mm -hmm. So one option we need to give girls is if they want to say no and not harm the relationship, they do have an option of saying, I need to leave, someone is expecting me, or something like that. The other reason Deborah Cameron questions this advice is that a flat no is actually seen as a fairly hostile gesture. And she has pointed out, if we have a young woman who's in a situation where she feels threatened or frightened, do we really want to encourage her to use a speech act that is widely regarded as aggressive? Confrontational. Yeah. Aggressive, yeah. And so we also want to give girls an option of using an excuse for safety, right? And what I further kind of develop in my thinking in the book is we can't really tell girls there's one right way to speak under any conditions, right? Communication is wildly context dependent. Even nonverbal communication is hugely complex and then you throw words on top of it, it's hugely complex. So I talk in this book about helping girls build out a verbal toolkit, right? Where they have a whole variety of options at their disposal. So every girl should have a hammer, right? There may be times where a really blunt no is exactly what is called for. But she should have other tools too because the context will change and we don't want girls feeling like they don't have the tool they need in the moment to make what they want to have happen, happen. Even if it means, if you, if you just use your parents, say, you know, if yeah. I do this, my parents will do yeah, whatever. Yeah, anything. I mean, yeah. we're, I am much more interested in having girls do what it is they want to do than telling them there's one right way to make it happen. Right. This is a fantastic book. Thank oh, you so thank much you. for writing it. And thank congratulations. You. It's a New York that. Times uh, bestseller. I appreciate that. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here, Dr. Amour. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you.